So welcome to another in our Top Step webinar series. Uh, at the end of the year, we, we tend to focus on things like admin cleanup and reporting. So of course, today's topic is reporting. Uh, here's what we're going to cover today in our reporting uh, tips and techniques. So uh, we have quite a few of these webinars out there related to reporting, but every time I try to tr change it up a bit on the topic coverage because there is so much to cover in reporting. Uh, so today we're going to focus on um, what does it mean to configure your system to support reporting. Open Air's reporting engine is something that they built themselves uh, when Open Air, the company, started in 1999. So we want to kind of understand what it's looking for to be able to support reporting easily and, of course, how to work around that or work with that or through that, as the case may be, uh, to get those reports out that you want. We'll also talk about what's the best practice for report development, as well as handling challenges that you may be facing today. And of course, at the end, we'll have a Q&A that's going to be open, uh, open mic. The recording will stop, and uh, you certainly can throw some challenges my way, and we can do a stump the chump um, session uh, so that I can get you through some of your reporting headaches. So let's start off with configurations, and, and really the configuration drives your reporting. Uh, I always like to think of the terms of when you go to deploy Open Air, you're not so much thinking about how to capture the data, it's how to get the data back out of it, and that drives a lot of feature functionality and data tagging, really. So filtering is a big key piece of reporting in Open Air because that you want to be able to include and exclude things uh, easily. Reporting is, uh, filtering is focused on lists of data, include these items, exclude these items. It is not context-based at this time. So I can't say give me everything that starts with the letter um, T, for example. I have to sort of add all the individual values that have the letter T it, uh, starting it. So, so the focus on, on the filtering aspects of the reports are really on lists and those include all the major object or main object tables, things like projects, clients, users, uh, services, booking types, uh, expense items, uh, time types, task types. Those are all lists of things that you have in your system, and those are very much a driver for how you can set up your reports to include or exclude things um, very easily. Now, those main tables are where your data is stored, your user, project, client, those are all main data tables. And you have your ancillary tables that have some descriptive information, booking types, expense items, time types, services. Um, but typically you want to tag things more with uh, more options for reporting. Those fall into the custom field category and you really need to focus on what data values you would have to filter on, um, and that would drive the type of custom field that you are reporting on. So if, if you are tra capturing things like sales rep, and sales rep needs to be uh, a, a value that you can control on a report so you can filter by a certain sales rep, you by then definition have to pick a list type custom field, drop down, pick list, radio group, checkbox, multi-selection. Now, as you're setting up your custom fields, the other consideration is what is a, is your list of values very dynamic? Sales rep is a great example, I think, because sales reps tend to change quite often in organizations. And so what you want to do is you want to future-proof your uh, custom field and your configuration so that it can handle the dynamics of that field. Um, so if it is something like sales rep and it changes often, you would want to consider using a pick list custom field. It still gives you a list, but basically what it does is that list is pointing to a defined table, and those tables typically have an inactive and active checkbox option. Uh, so things like vendor, department, purchase items, uh, service lines one through five, any table that you, um, there's, there's certain tables in the system that you may not be using at all in your configuration, so why not repurpose those tables as your pick list source for sales rep and then you can control that list very cleanly in the system. If your list is fairly static, uh, kind of like offering types or, um, um, you know, uh, contract types, uh, then a, a drop-down or a radio group is a pretty good option because 
uh, you'll rarely change those, or if you do change them, you'll do it in a corded, cord, you'll mostly add to it. You know, um, The caution I have in here is that if you use a radio group, um, radio groups, I don't use those very often because once you select a radio group, you can't unselect it because it will require you to select a value as part of the radio group versus a drop-down where you can select something and then you can clear it back out if you want to. And drop-downs can actually have value dependency. So there is a feature that allows you to have a dependent drop-down list. So if you pick value X, you'll only get values A, B, C in a subsequent dependent field. But the, the thing that I caution folks most about um, driving configuration for reporting is um, if you're using a drop-down and you decide you need to fix a typo or you want to change a current value that's in the list, um, be careful because that will actually create what I call ghost values in the system that reports can pick up sometimes and not others or list views can pick up. Um, so it's, it's not uh, like an active-inactive flag. You have to be very careful if you're changing the values in the drop-down list. Now, there's uh, also a consideration of you're adding a custom field so that you can support reporting, but would the custom field be as accessible as a filter in the field in general, in the, in the report in general? And a lot of the custom field availability is driven by the type of report you're using and the type of object that you put the custom field on. So if you see the screenshot here, you can see things like services practice and users employee type and projects note required on timesheets. Those are all checkboxes or lists or something that have been added to those objects, and they are um, what I tend to relate to as power objects, um, where they have a, a dominance in the reporting engine of OpenAir. So if you add a custom field to it, um, you would be able to use that custom field in filtering. Uh, an example where you think you would be able to use a custom field, but you, you can't, uh, is like a billing rule, for example. So if you put a custom field like a drop-down on a billing rule, um, there's always a native thinking that, okay, well, the billing rule is related to charges, so therefore I should be able to get to use the billing rule field, custom field, as a filter on reports. Um, but you really would only be able to use that on certain tabular reports. You can't use it on cross-tab reports because billing rules by nature are not a power field or a power object. Uh, power objects tend to be things like the user record, client record, project record, services, uh, invoices, believe it or not, cost centers, and customer POs. So you'll see that there's a lot of controls related to financial related objects uh, in the system. And that's where those are ones where you put custom fields on these objects and you'll be able to see those filters in reports. If you put it on other things like an expense report, you can't, you can't see that custom field unless you use an expense report tabular report. Um, the other, uh, besides filters and custom fields, the other configuration to consider is dates. Um, I like to say that there are more date fields on a single record than there are data elements on a single record in some cases. Uh, for example, a time entry, if you've ever done a time entry tabular report or a detail report, uh, you see a whole mess of filter at the options at the top of the report, you know, including when was the time entry created, when was the timesheet created, uh, when was the... Um, that what's the actual date of the time entry, accounting dates, and so forth. So you see a lot of date-related fields on that single piece of information. And the reason you would use these different fields is really dependent on the kind of report that you're, you're dealing with. So sometimes it's kind of difficult to think of like, well, should I use timesheet start date? Well, if you're using weekly timesheets, weekly timesheets tend to fall across months. So if you're looking for weekly data, yes. If you're looking for monthly data, no. So it really comes down to what is the report that you're building so that you can understand what the date index should be in the system. And if you're not familiar with, uh, so this is a cross-tabbed report or a summary report, there's actually an option section that says what time, what date field do you want to use for various um, transactional pieces of information, like the timesheets, for example or expenses or projects or so forth. So these are the options that are currently available for a reporting perspective. And then on top of that, there's additional report filtering sections at the bottom, um, additional date filtering options, such as um, timesheet create date, uh, time entry create date, and so forth, that you can use for filtering. But these 
fields under the option sections are the indexes into the timetable in order for you to pull the right dated time into the system and then you can use the other time date filters to control the, the um, which pieces of data to pull in. So there's a filter option and then there's an index option. This is the index option that you want. So, so why would you use these different values and where, where would the filtering come in? Um, think about, you know, like a compliance report. A compliance report is, are people putting their timesheets in on time? And when you're looking at a report like that, you're looking at things like, when was the, what's the time that the timesheet is covering? So October 31st to whatever. And when was it submitted and when was it approved? Those dates give you an ability to understand how many days passed before something was due or not due, uh, so to speak. So the com compliance reports focus on more start and end dates and submission actions. First is a financial date. The financial dates want to deal with things more like the actual date the work was done or accounting dates if you have that feature turned on so that it understands how that time uh, or information relates to the accounting period that you're dealing with. Uh, versus utilization. So utilization, you may have a different control that says maybe you're focusing on approval date, maybe you're focusing on the date of the time entry. Um, what is your utilization metric? And is it for bonuses or is it for metrics related to the company? So the, even then, within utilization, you could pick different dates. Um, project management tends to be a little bit close to financials because you want to be able to manage the project, uh, but you may not care too much about the accounting period that it fell in, just the fact that it was worked. Uh, and then the audits, uh, things like uh, when did somebody put their August time in? If they put their August time in by creating the timesheet in December, then that's, that's a problem, especially when it comes to vendors. And there's a lot of uh, combinations of time filters and time indexes that can give you the different reports. So that's what would drive um, the date selection you have. Not every date selection is the same for every report. So consider the source of the information and the time alignment um, that you want to include. And then there's always the, uh, the dreaded timing dependency. So uh, often I get this request a request that people want a daily revenue report, a daily revenue report so that every day I see how much revenue I'm earning. Um, unfortunately, their timesheet period is weekly, which means their timesheets don't get approved except for once a week. And after the timesheet's approved, then they can recognize revenue. So a daily report gives you no benefit if you have a weekly approval process. It's just apples to oranges. So you have to think about things like um, using the charge projections feature and, and having it push data through this calculated function, which is found under application settings, project settings, um, and having worked hours, for example, be something that you push through billing and revenue rules to be able to calculate um, your earned revenue on a daily basis. Okay. Now, having said that, um, you still may not want to wait for this to happen because it happens on a daily basis or on an ad hoc individual uh, generation project uh, projections feature. Uh, so what you could also think about is how do you have your charge projections set up and then look at setting up custom calculations that sort of break up the data entries and recalculate your quote unquote daily revenue as you need to using date indexes that are available as part of the custom calculation functionality, which was in last month's webinar. So definitely um, feel free to listen to that one so you can understand that more more often. Now, having considered that, there's obviously many, many more things to talk about for us with uh, configuration, but we have three other topics to cover, so we're going to jump right into report development. And here, um, the best practices on report development is, is really asking your, your, yourself, what do I need the report to do, and sit down and design it out. Like, I scribble things on papers all the time or in spreadsheets trying to figure out what do I need to do. Um, jumping into sort of adding and subtracting fields, you can get lost in the weeds pretty quickly. Uh, so really the first question you have to ask yourself is who is the audience that tends to drive the level of detail or the need to drill down into detail like subgroups um, for the system based on who is looking at it. If it's meant for a, a graph in the system, a dashboard graph, you probably don't need a lot of detail. You don't need a lot of detail fields because it's going to summarize up anyway. 
But if somebody is doing detailed, you know, uh, accrual analytics at the end of a month, you'll probably need to do a lot of sub subgroups, subtotaling, and adding a lot of information to interpret data, such as what's the unit price on, on a, um, a billing rule, or what is um, the cost rate of a user, you know, things like that. So that you want to add those fields to help them use the data in the system. Um, those of you who are global, currency consideration is always a pain in the butt because uh, you have to deal with, do you bring everything in in native, which there's only a few options available to bring in native values, but of course then those won't total. So now you're dealing with, okay, I want to look at everything in USD, GBP, and EUR, um, and then from there I can extract the information as I need to for reporting. So some considerations on that. And then the time periods, we just talked about the date indexes, um, what information needs to align with what date indexes for it to be able to come up on the reporting. Accounting dates are pretty popular, especially when you're dealing with financials. Uh, and then is the report something that you want to bring a holistic view in? As a project manager, I want to see everything about the project. Um, as a manager or a um, P&L owner, I want to understand my future view only from a forecasting perspective on if I'm going to hit my targets. So that will drive your configuration of your port. And of course, do you need to restrict the view of data? GDPR is all over uh, our considerations nowadays. So we want to make sure people are only seeing what they're supposed to see uh, and they are not sending data out automatically in any kind of form that would violate uh, those policies. <clears throat> and then custom calculations. These are the options for you to be able to create your own versions of reporting values. Now, the caution I have here for folks is that the custom calculations are a pretty neat feature. When you run the report and you look at it inside OpenAir, it looks great. Then you download it into a pivot table version. Some of you know that option where you could say um, enable the ability to see it as a pivot table. And then suddenly all your custom calculations look like it's you know something divided by a million and it, they turn into some weird scientific value. Um, the custom calculations tend to rely on the relationship of the rows and subgroups that you have in the system. When you change it into a pivot table, it loses that relationship. So just be cautious of that on your um, custom calculations. Play around with it and see if you can pull data into a single, a single row versus subgroups, uh, because then you would be able to maintain the custom calculation value uh, easier in pivot tables. And if you're not familiar with what I mean about um, you know, maintain single rows versus subgroups. Uh, let's use this example. The example here, you know, the request is, I need to see all hours down to the task level. So a natural thing to do is say, okay, let me look at the client, subtotal by project, subtotal by task, okay? And then click that bot the button for pivot table and then I get all the data I need to, to be able to, to play around with. Uh, but your custom calculation is gonna be dependent on that relationship all the way backwards. So what would be an easier way to, to think about it is change it to actually just a single row as task and then add client and project as descriptor fields, detail fields, and then add your custom field because then what happens is everything's very nice and clean. You don't even have to set up a pivot table. You just download it as is because now everything, all the relationship is in a single row in the system. Similarly, if you want to add those custom field values, just understand that the order of those fields is completely dependent on the order of the rows. So here I have task subtotaled by user, and I have a couple of fields for tasks and a couple fields for users, and you can see the order that they're showing up in. If I reverse that order, all the user fields will show up first before task because I've changed the subtotal or order from user to task and from the task to user. So it really depends on where you need to push the data. Uh, and that will also drive in um, your pivot table downloads. Another thing, another tip here is um, data view controls. So very important with GDPR. Um, I still tend to use the functionality, which is the report filter set. The report filter set is something, it's an uh, ac ac access that you give to people other than administrators, they get it automatically, but you can put it in the role and this filter set, when people run it, it will pay attention to what the filter set controls on um, the project. So example, in this um, self-view only, I have it set to myself. If I run the report, it's only gonna give me data related to me. 
uh, likewise my project's only data that I own. Um, some of you may be familiar that there's a few meta value values available now in OpenAir. So instead of a user filter, you could say me as the user filter. But just be aware that that will limit the report to just that one single filter. And you know, often I get the report of, hey, I want to be able to know all the people that report to me as well as myself on a report. And you can only do that with a filter set. You can't do it with those meta value filters in the system. So I, I still tend to focus on the filter set. It's more control for me and it's an easier way to maintain the um, report maintenance going forward. Um, another question I get um, for challenges is uh, things like, why can't I report on bill rate? It's right there. It's a value on the billing rule or the user's cost rate or something like that. Um, why can't I get it on a report? And the answer is you can, you just have to recalculate it. So you have to reverse engineer um, custom calculation. So uh, things like well, if you can use projections or actuals, timesheet data is a really good example of using something to, to back into a cost rate, for example, um, because the cost is available on the table. Uh, so you can basically use a custom calculation to reverse engineer and get a bill rate reporting value and that bill rate reporting value can then be used in other calculations to come up with you know, your own projections or your own forecast, for example. So, so just because you can't get to it doesn't mean you cannot figure out how to get to it eventually. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, there's those date ranges on the custom calculations that give you the ability to make sure that you can get a bill rate that's going to be applicable for the right date range. <clears throat> Now, another challenge um, that I see often, and this is where when you're using custom calculations, you're mixing types of objects in the equation uh, where you expect something to come out, but nothing does. Uh, an example is uh, if you have an equation that says all booked hours times one, where one is a time entry constant, um, as long as the project has time on it and you, you run a report with this calculation, the equation works. But if you run a report that only has bookings and no time on it yet, um, there will be a zero on the report. So it doesn't matter how many booked hours you have, all booked hours times one is not, this is where one doesn't equal one. One equals zero if, if the, the object that's defining the constant doesn't exist related to that project. So just be careful with those custom calculations. Uh, and the other caution always is with the filtering that you do on a custom calculation. Just remember that the custom calculation um, will always win, okay? So if you try to filter in a report the same field that the custom calculation is filtered on, the custom calculation will win, then it will ignore your report filter, okay? Um, the other challenge I, I see with folks, uh, especially with complicated reporting, uh, I like to call it the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, which is really the object relationship table. Uh, it's like, how do you get from A to B? Um, basically, database tables have relationships with each other. It's a relational database. However, this table, table A does not necessarily relate to table C, even though they both have table B in common. So they may not be directly related. And what you have to do is you have to define a common type of data that ties them together. I love this little thing, so I put it in here. Um, so what is the common piece of information that ties data together? And there are some, um, some power, those power objects are ones that tie data together. Services, time type, projects, um, those are all uh, common data ties that can pull multiple pieces of information together. They tend to be financial in, in um, nature. Um, the other thing to consider is if you don't have an ability to, to force like service to go all the way through consistently for your time entries and your charges, for example, consider a scripting solution that sort of backfills any kind of gaps or missing field data based on the resulting uh, output. So if you create a bunch of charges through a billing rule, the billing rule supplies the service, you could have a script that picks up that service and goes back and sets it on the time entry. So therefore, you have a consistent way to do reporting in open air. Um, and the last challenge with uh, uh, open air reporting, you know, here's the O Tannenbaum, you know, O data connector uh, reference. Uh, 
OpenAir's reporting engine was built by OpenAir. It controls access to many of the tables and the fields that are available uh, on your reports, uh, but you can't get to every single field that's in the database table. Uh, and you may need more detail to do your analytics in the system. Um, the way OpenAir, there's certain uh, data object relationships that are not supported in the reporting engine, but you know that there is a, a common relationship between the two. So instead of creating two reports, you just want to create one. Um, I would consider using or purchasing the OData connector if you, your company does not have that yet. Um, it gives you the ability to publish sort of raw data reports from OpenAir, the tabular reports uh, and list views in, in the system that you can pull into your, um, your BI tool like Tableau and build, build your own dashboards, build your own um, you know, relationships of data uh, based on data that's coming from OpenAir. So there's a nice refresh option with the OData connector. Uh, the other thing to consider, uh, which is a bigger effort, is really um, building an integration, like using the APIs the APIs can now get to a large majority of the fields, if not all of the fields, depending on what table you're talking about. And it can pull the information in a refresh state into like a data warehouse where, of course, then you can do all kinds of stuff with it because you're building your own database outside of open air um, to access the data. And, and, of course, you would still be able to control all the fields as necessary in that data warehouse. And the third option is really uh, there's an automatic backup service, if you're not aware of it, that basically creates a complete copy of your database, uh, which means you don't really have to build an integration. You just basically take the backup service and there, all the tables are there. You can just build something to sit on top of it or an index into it because it's all the um, relationship data um, within OpenAir's database. Okay. The final thing that we want to talk about is report maintenance. And, um, you know, the common question is, as many of you, as you continue to work with Open Air and every year you come up with a new great idea, you can leave this web webinar and you create your next new 10 best reports, and then suddenly you're in a Waters Waldo situation of, what's that report again? Who owned it? And there's like seven versions of the same thing. So the so report maintenance really is something that um, does not get enough attention. Uh, it's something that sort of gets an overhaul once every couple of years in a lot of uh, customer accounts. So, so I definitely um, have some suggestions on maintenance that I hope that you consider. Um, naming convention is a big one, and if people are saving their own copies of reports, uh, I highly recommend people put their initials at the end of it so that you don't see seven versions of the same report with different owners. You see seven, ver seven variations of the same report, but you know that they're owned by um, their, their personal reports, not the main report that's owned by um, a, central, a central owner, uh, like a report admin. Okay? So naming conventions are big, organizing it by folders is big, dedicating a user account to own all the reports is big. Uh, you can always proxy in as the person to be able to do the administration and that reporting, um, you know, that you can't proxy in as an admin, but you can uh, proxy as a reporting role that perhaps has some power to be able to edit the reports as you need to, okay, or log in as the report admin. Um, don't forget about the status tab. It can be sort of forgotten about because it's sort of sitting there at the end after saved reports. The status tab gives you some pretty important functionality where you can change the owner of a report. If somebody has a report that you think should be shared with everyone and it should be part of the standard deck, Change the report owner to the standard report owner so that everyone knows, hey, we're going we're gonna to make this somebody's, um, the, the, main, um, the main report catalog. Uh, also here, if you're not aware of it, um, when people schedule reports and suddenly the reports are coming out every week and you realize you didn't really want them every week, you just wanted them once. Uh, so you can actually remove the schedule from the status tab as well. Uh, an important tip. Something that I recently uh, learned about, because I don't think this, this has recently changed, in my opinion, um, if your user account, who the user account that owns the report, and that report is scheduled, if that user account is inactivated, OpenAir will automatically turn off the scheduling the next time the schedule is executed. So if I inactivate myself and I own seven scheduled reports, the next time each of those reports were going to run, if they detect that I've been inactivated, the schedule is removed from those reports automatically. So just be cautious of that, especially with user maintenance. 
Um, as you're setting up your reports and setting up your naming conventions, don't forget about the notes field. There's a notes field available in the settings area of reports. Uh, it's a nice way that you can use advanced filters to sort of search for keywords. Um, it doesn't, ha I mean, I like to put a little bit of an explanation in there, but if you really just want to put keywords in there, like tags, you certainly can do that. Um, but there, it's very helpful for folks. Uh, names alone are not necessarily descriptive enough for people to know what to use. Okay. Um, the other thing is the dreaded project dashboard. So I love project dashboard reports. They're very easy to find very large amounts of data that are related to a specific project if I do a single click. Unfortunately, it is also a place that gets junked up very quickly because you see two or three of the same things that people have saved reports. And what happens is when they go to save the report, they may not be able to see this usage designation or they see it, but they don't realize it's checked. And so they make a copy of it. That copy propagates that report to every project dashboard. Um, so consider giving people the ability to specify the report designation. Um, if you give people that ability, make sure they understand how to use it. If you decide not to give people that ability, when they copy a report, it will leave things checked. So you will have to basically um, take, as an administrator, take ownership to kind of review the product dashboard every now and then and, and turn off uh, those uh, check boxes for folks on their saved reports because they won't have the ability to do it themselves. Okay. Uh, and finally, it's really the deletion activity. So reports get old after a while. People have a lot of their own custom reports, projects that you used uh, five years ago has, still have a report that you were using, but you don't use it anymore. Get rid of them. You don't need those reports anymore. You can always create new ones, and there's always newer, better features coming in that would cause you to replace reports anyway. So I highly recommend that you uh, basically set up a maintenance schedule at least once a year. Let people know, hey, if you haven't run your report in more than you know, six months, um, we're going to be deleting it out of the system unless you tell us that that report is, um, must be kept, okay? Because there are such things as annual reports. And when you go to delete a report, you can delete individual reports. Administrators can delete anyone's report, okay? Um, so again, be cautious here because you do have superpowers. Uh, you can go to the status tab and you can delete individual reports. Um, another option, another option is uh, you could actually move all the reports that you want to delete to a specific user account that's, you know, for example, an inactive one that you plan to, to use. And then you can run this maintenance action. Uh, it's one of the few maintenance actions I recommend people look at. Uh, it's under global settings and there's an option that says delete saved reports from inactive users. Um, you do not have any filter ability here. Anyone who's inactive that has an account or uh, a report will be deleted. So you, you certainly don't want to delete um, saved reports that uh, folks are using. So this, this is sort of a last ditch effort. Um, and uh, you may want to use the status option uh, a little bit more heavily because you get more control with that. Okay. And that gets us to through the four topics, there's obviously you can you guys know there's tons of stuff here, but the key thing about getting reports out of OpenAir is understanding the data structure of OpenAir and how to tag that data, how to leverage things like the custom fields, custom calculations, um, how to use filtering to your advantage so that you're getting what you need. You certainly want to understand who is looking at the report, why is it being used in general, so that you can get those date indexes right. Uh, and then be able to put a report governance policy in place in order to avoid chaos. Um, because as we know, when you run a report, you can see how clean the data is, but once the data is clean, it gives you a clean report. But then that gives you the ability to clean the data, which gives you the clean reports, which gives you the ability to clean the data, and so forth and so on. So it's an ever-evolving loop of how to get the most out of your system um, by using the reports and keeping that data clean. So you guys get it. Um, reporting is very important, but it's only as good as the data. And once you start down the path of using reports, you will actually be able to see how clean your data is and you'll have confidence in the information that we have. So that brings us to the end of uh, the webinar. Now, thank you very much for your attendance throughout the year uh, on our webinars, and we hope to see you in 2020.